anyone who wants to, to create a coin gym can immediately do it. And people who are happy to leave their computer on all the time, they can make small, small amounts of money. Wallet Wasabi, coming soon. Okay, hi everybody. Hi, Bibi people. Welcome to another episode of Cyberpunks 101. Um, today we're joined by um, with uh, Chris Belcher. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, Chris, can you give us a little bit about you, your story before Bitcoin? Uh, so I'm I'm a, an open source programmer in Bitcoin, and I'm mostly interested in the technology and partly for ideological reasons. And I learned about Bitcoin around in 2013. And then it took me some time to learn about it and start programming. But I've been involved since then. 2013. Uh, what did you do for fun before Bitcoin? Rather, rather than... Uh, I've done a few things like... Um, I don't know, I go rock climbing or... Um, hiking, that kind of stuff, okay. play board games. Board games like chess? I'm a good chess player. Yeah, chess and Settlers of Catan, oh, okay. um, that kind of stuff. It's good, good. All right, and then when did you, you said you first discovered a Bitcoin in 2013. Um, what motivated you to take action and get involved? Well, I thought I, I knew um, a fair bit about cryptography from beforehand, that I'd used PGP and Tor and that kind of thing. And I'd always been interested in how it works, especially the mathematics of it. And okay, I just thought PGP and Tor. Yes. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, so PGP is um, it's one of the first open source encryption softwares. It was made in around 1990 or 1991, and it allowed anybody in the world to make uh, an encrypted message that nobody could open, so no uh, no enemy or adversary or anything like that. Uh, and it was, it, was quite, um, it was quite important because at the time many people, so the American government tried to stop it being distributed. And there was okay. a whole, uh, there was like a political um, movement, I guess, to make it be available to anyone. anyone and uh, one, of the pos one of the positive benefits of it was in the end, it was used for not exactly the same program, but it was used for things like online shopping. Uh, because oh. you need to c protect your credit card details. Credit card information, right? Something. Yeah. And Tor um, is the same thing? Yeah, so Tor is a way to, it's, uh, it's another similar kind of privacy technology and it uses cryptography and it's a way to use the internet or browse the internet without revealing your IP address. So without revealing the address of your computer or your, your internet service provider or anything like that. Uh, so it has many different uses used by many different people, including Bitcoin. All right, so you just gravitated towards Bitcoin all because of the privacy and the whole idea behind Bitcoin, right? Yeah, yeah, and the cryptography. And they're all, um, if you look at how these things work, I've always found them quite interesting that they, uh, like the, the encryption in, in PGP, it's got, uh, I mean, look, the mathematics of it has a nice feel, the, it's called RSA cryptography, and that's quite. Uh, so it uses. It, I've found it. I said it uses prime numbers. Like you, you okay. have you your uh, your private key, which which you use to make an encrypt. You know, to decode an encrypted message is essentially two prime numbers, and it's got a fun uh, a property of that is that if you have two prime numbers, you can very easily multiply them together. Like five times three, you can multiply it to find fifteen. But yeah. if you had the number 15, it's much harder to find their products, find five and three. Obviously, for number 15, oh, it's easy. It's quite small. It's better to work with the smaller numbers, smaller yeah. prime numbers. Okay. Yeah, but if right. you... Fair enough. Yeah, and obviously, when you make them very big, like hundreds of digits, it's much harder. So that provide, that's called a trapdoor function. But it's easy to go one way, but hard to go the other way. The other way. Oh, okay. So that makes the... That has the, that leads to this property that only one person can decrypt a message, you know, the rightful owner who has the private key, but anyone can encrypt it or send it to them. Okay. Now you mentioned private key for newbies like myself and those watching. We don't know what that is. Right. What is a private key? Okay. So a private key is a number. It, it's or it's any information that it allows you to um, uh, in cryptography either to decrypt a message or um, or to make a digital signature. So in 
uh, I'll start with a message example that you can, uh, it, it's, it's just a number and you, it has a, another number associated with it called the public key. And this public key, you publish it to anyone in the world and it has your name on it. And right. uh, someone can use your public key to encrypt a message and send it to you, but only you who have the private key can decrypt okay. it. Okay. And so for, that's for signatures, it. yeah, for signatures, it's, uh, it's used in, I mean, the direct way that it's used in Bitcoin is to make the concept of ownership. That if you want to transfer a Bitcoin from A to B, you, right. it's a bit like writing a, a check those old style checks in banks that I want money to go from account A to account B and then you sign it with your hand, you write your signature with, with a yeah. pencil. But that's not okay. very secure because anyone can like, you know, change the number. Forge your signature. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, forge your signature or anything like that. But the digital signature is not based on handwriting, it's based on mathematics and cryptography. And that has the property that if you make a message like transfer from bank account A to B and do a digital signature, then it's very, very, very difficult to forge it or you know add a zero or anything okay. like that and that's part yes. of the way bitcoin and works so uh, in bitcoin a, a private something key, like that yeah in bitcoin a private key is um it's your it's like your your ownership of those bitcoins if you lose your private keys then you've lost the bitcoins fair enough that's tragic though <laughs> If you lose your private key, you can't have access to no other way to get access to your Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Oh boy. Okay. All right. Uh, your current project is Join Market, correct? Yeah. Uh, you, did you do any projects before that? No. Yeah, uh, there were some small ones, but they never really got very popular. There were also one was private involved for privacy. It was called Coin Jumble. Um, and it was a way to, it was, I thought you could use uh, CoinJoin, the same technology that JoinMarkey uses, but if you had a very fancy GUI, a user inf interface with buttons you could click and stuff, then maybe more people would use it. Uh, but it hmm. never got used. So the reason back then in 2014, the reason nobody used JoinMarkey was not because there was no GUI for it, it was for other reasons. Okay, but everything built up to this project join market yeah all right that's good uh tell us more about join market and what is it how did you come up with the idea etc okay so it's um so the the point of bitcoin is that there's a it's a currency that has a low requirement for trust so that you and the way it does that is that every person every entity in the network can check all the rules so they can check that no one's invented bitcoins out like printed infinite bitcoins for example and to do mm -hmm. that they need to check that every transaction hasn't created any bitcoins that if a transaction has i don't know one bitcoin going in then one bitcoin has to go out and you can't have whatever infinite bitcoins go out and that means that every transaction has to be public and visible to everybody it has to be broadcast and when a new person joins the network they have to download every transaction and check them all that they're valid and right. the the fact that they're all public means that uh, there's privacy problems because essentially everyone can see that money's gone from account A to wow. account B. Okay. Correct. Uh -huh. And that's not very desirable. So over the years, a lot of people have been thinking about ways to help privacy problems, to make it better, uh, but still make it possible for everyone to check that the that is valid, that no bitcoins have been created out of nothing. So, uh, so everybody can con go back and check the um, blockchain. Thingy. Yes, exactly. What's been going so on? when you okay. and in around in 2013, uh, Greg Maxwell came up with this idea, which he called CoinJoin, and that was when you have, if you have many people who want to make a Bitcoin transaction, they come together. I don't know five people, and together they create one Bitcoin transaction, but it has okay. five inputs and five outputs, and then. Uh, that would improve privacy because if you if you saw this transaction with five inputs and five outputs, you couldn't tell which input ma mapped to, mi to which output. Right. So I don't know if someone someone's input is in position number one, their output could be in any position one, two, three, four, or five. Okay, I think yes, Adam Gibson mentioned that as well in our last in interview. So you came up with the idea of join market, like how, yeah, what. So, so join market is uh, the thing it solves is, well, the, the problem CoinJoin has is you need to get five people together 
at the yes. same time to agree exactly. to do this transaction mm -hmm. and um and that's that's quite hard to do so there have been there were other people who tried to implement join market and it ended up being that the users would have to wait around like they're waiting for five people and know we you know to who arrived they need to wait for two more and it's really annoying to use right. so join market is this idea i came up with where you have um some of the, the people who are waiting around they get compensation for it so they can take a small fee okay. um and right. and that then incentivizes them to wait around so you um so the way it would work is if you want to make a join market a coin join with five people there's four people or more who are just waiting they have their computer on all the time right. and they have a message saying you can create a coin join with me but you have to pay me like 0.1 like percent commission yeah exactly and then right. the one person who wants to create a coin join straight away like without waiting at all they can pay the 0.1 or whatever the fee is and um and then that creates a this structure that there's anyone who wants to, to create a coin join can immediately do it and people who are happy to leave their computer on all the time they can make small small amounts of money yes and okay. then i talk to some people in yeah yeah, it's a it's a little bit like mining, I guess, but much less much less money, and it's much easier. That's what I was uh, saying. And then I, I, I thought it was like mining, but I didn't want to say. It. Yeah, because it's kind yeah, of the, different. the thing with mining yeah. is you have to you have to use a lot of electricity. Like that's the, mm -hmm. the point of it, and you need big machines and stuff. And with this, it uses very little electricity, but you need to own many bitcoins, and then your oh. bitcoins are being they they go in this transaction as well. Like if you own whatever ten bitcoins, you can only make a coin join up to. 10 bitcoins okay. um and and then i uh, i talked to some other people yeah uh, i talked to some other people in the community and they said the idea was good and um then you know the people would use it and then i coded it so I programmed it and it took me about i think uh, a few months to make like a first version it was very basic and then from there it was just improving it and other people helped me improve it and there's loads of help from many people which i'm very appreciative of and um then it, it is here until today so today there's at least for my i mean uh for my join market bots there's like 10 or 20 coin join transactions per day um okay. so it's going quite well and it seems anyone who wants to improve their privacy can just use it okay so who else was involved in your team i'm aware that adam gibson was there and uh yes, what wax ring why did you choose him? Why did you choose to collaborate with each other? We just, I don't know, I, I like, I published a project ever I could and, um, you know, invited people, if you know how to program, you can, if you're interested in this, you can help out. And it just all showed up, I guess. They, they were interested and they helped and they joined the, the IRC channel and, and the, the discussion forums. And on GitHub and well, everything. Else else like that. So there's uh, there's someone called Adley, then there's uh, Alex Cato, um, there's a few. Uh, Greg Maxwell helped. So he didn't code much, but he gave a, a lot of ideas. Okay. And then I'm just going to look at, hold on, I've got them all in. I'm just looking at the page now. I can give you a whole list. But there, there's a good few people. It's it's open source. So it's when people have a bit of time and a bit of a bit of care and a bit of effort, then they contribute and then if they get busy they contribute a bit less and it all works out and in the end. so the open source is basically like uh, a place where you just go in pick a project and if you're interested just add what okay you can, i see or? so i'll explain what open source is so okay. um so all so software programming it's it's a bit like writing a recipe you have to write down what the program should do and it's in a language you understand but also the computer understands okay. and normally this is called the source code and then you take the source code and you uh you give it to the computer and it'll run the program and normally the source code is in, in commercial companies it's kept as a trade secret in most cases like microsoft and amazon and apple they're all there's closed source so their source is a secret to them and they only give you the end program okay. and open source is another way of organizing development where the source can be read by everyone um, and then if you know how to program you could either learn from it or you could contribute to it and in um, in Bitcoin everything is open source and the reason is if it was closed source then you it could steal your money so if you had a, a Bitcoin wallet which is closed source there could be some code which says 
transfer all your money to, you know, this thief. And that doesn't happen in open source because everyone can read the source code. And then they could raise the alarm and say, don't use this, you know, it'll steal your money. Uh, okay. And also, but how do you control who gets to make changes on it? So you have, um, it's a, it, there's no kind of it, like the, the source code is copied to everyone that's on, you, you have websites which help you do this. So there's GitHub, which is every account can make a copy. They call it forking, uh, make okay. a copy to their account and then they can edit it. And um, generally you have a link, the link, you know, if you want to use join market or Bitcoin or whatever, then you go to this GitHub account, but people can use other ones. So generally it's about, um, there's no kind of the project. It's sort of about what people choose to run. Okay. I don't know if that made sense, but there's no, so authors of a project can't impose, they can't force someone to run their software, if you see what I mean. Right. It's, it's still, the control is still in your hands. It's up to you whether you allow or take the advice. Take the oh, right. Or yeah, yeah. Okay. So if someone wants, yeah, someone has a contribution and they add it to kind of the, the main repository, then people discuss and say, you know, this is good or bad. And, and um, yeah, so if, if, if someone tried to add code, which like did something bad or tried to steal everyone's money, then that wouldn't be added. Right. And even if it was added, then people could say, oh no, there's, there's bad code here that steals your money and don't yeah, run it because it's unsafe. Okay, fair enough. Um, do you see any other projects that catch your interest besides yours? Uh, yeah, the, the, in terms of privacy, there's a few projects. There was, um, so actually, a very early one before join market was there's one called dark wallet which was also it was a, also a way of improving privacy that used coin join and it was um it was similar in some ways and different in others and that was quite good that was uh even though it, it was never used very much it was still uh, influential for me and dark wallet was... that doesn't exactly sound the best positive thing to use but Go well, ahead. I suppose if you if you own some money and you and you want to uh, and you want to transact with it, then being in private in darkness could be a good thing for you. And then it, it's all part of your Fair opinion, enough. really. Fair but enough. in uh, other projects have been there's I'm just trying to think now. Well, there's this been this Tumblebit and Hidden Wallet. They're quite recent, and that that's quite good as well. Okay. So okay. Um, there there have been more. It's more so far. There's been more about ideas rather than projects. So there's that idea of confidential transactions. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a way of also improving privacy in Bitcoin. But it's not. It's still being. It's still undergoing research. So there's not like an actual project you can download. Okay, fair enough. Um, what do you think would happen uh, regarding the future of Bitcoin? What changes do you expect? Do you think? Uh, probably over the. I think the most exciting thing right now is the Lightning Network, and that's a way of improving um, improving the scalability of Bitcoin is the main motivation. But it has other good uses, and one of them is that would probably improve the privacy. Um, the scalability, gonna... meaning the right? yeah. So the scalability is when, as a system, as a system gets more users, then how can the system respond to it? Uh, so with Okay. With, uh, with Bitcoin has this issue that every transaction has to be transacted to everyone. So okay. if there's like 10 users, then only 10 people have to download it and that's fine. But if you get to a million users, that means a million people have to it download it. It's a little overwhelming for the system. Yeah, so it may, it may make it slow down or something. And that that's because Bitcoin inherently has, or at least the blockchain has, a, it has bad scalability properties in that sense. And Lightning uh, improves that a lot by making it that transactions don't have to be downloaded by everyone. They only have to be downloaded and checked by the people involved. Oh. So if, if there's a transaction from A to B, only A and B need to check it rather than everyone okay. needs to check it. Okay, and regards to reaching the average show, because right now it's still a bit complicated for any and everybody to use. I mean, yeah. my grandmother and my younger siblings can't, you know, access this. Yeah. So when do you think, do you think that in the future, the near future, it will be easier for people like myself? Yeah, I hope so. Although um, the way I kind of see it is it's similar in a lot of ways, I think, to Linux. Like if you wanted to, you could say Bitcoin is like the Linux of money, that it's very, it is much harder to use than Windows or Apple or something. But then 
like it, it still exists. It's still there, maybe used by 5% of people for 20 years. And then you mm -hmm. get to the point where there's something like Android on smartphones, and that is actually yeah. a kind of Linux. And then you end up in a situation today where actually most people use Linux without realizing on their smartphone or their, on their tablet. So I think that could oh. happen in the next, I mean, I don't want to put the time scale, but it's, it'll probably be longer than you think. And then when it arrives, <laughs> you'll, you may be surprised. So who knows? That's okay. It's good. Uh, what can we look forward from you in the future? Uh, so right now, actually, I'm working on um, this. I'm working on this idea to, that also helps improve the privacy, and it's uh, about Electrum personal server. And uh, I'll explain a bit about that. But Electrum is um, a Bitcoin wallet, and I think it's very good. It's my favorite wallet. But it has okay. a problem that it's it's not very private, and it's not it doesn't verify the rules. So it's one reason it's easy to use is that it's a lightweight wallet that doesn't have to download everything. And the problem there is that uh, you can be defrauded. So if there's a transaction which creates a million bitcoins out of nothing, it, with Electrum Wallet, you would it would be accepted. You'd accept it as normal. And okay. um, this idea, Electrum Personal Server, is about improving that. So it's a way of connecting Electrum Wallet to a Bitcoin full node. And that would mean that when you use Electrum, you would uh, you would have all the verification. So you'd check that the transactions are valid and real. And you'd also have very good privacy because you wouldn't have, uh, because you wouldn't be, so the way Electrum works right now is it connects to a central server. And this, the server tells you what your balance and history is, but also the server can spy on you because it knows oh. what your Bitcoin addresses are. And that's right. not very good. And uh, I'm hoping Electrum personal server could be one way to help this. Okay, so there's a yeah, difference there's an, between the, the central server and a full node, or yeah. So the the server itself has a full node, but it's it's not controlled by the users. It's controlled by whoever runs the servers or servers. Um, that so there's an important point with privacy is that it's not you you you. I don't think you can solve privacy by one technology like oh we'll we'll create join market or Tumblebit or whatever it might be and that'll completely solve. Because uh, privacy is a, it's a very multifaceted thing that you can, I don't know, you can have be completely private, have a completely private Bitcoin, and then you tell someone, oh, my name is this thing, Chris, whatever, and that would ruin your privacy. Uh, so there's many ways to have your privacy degraded, and we have to think about all of them to make right. privacy better. Yeah, because right now, banks are running it. We don't trust them, so yeah, you guys for example, keep yeah. doing what you're doing. <laughs> All right. Well, we've come to the end of this episode. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having and me. Tune in. Thank you. Tune in next time, guys, for our new episode. Enjoy. Wallet Wasabi coming soon. So let's say CoinShuffle Plus Plus was the, the second version of CoinShuffle. Mm -hmm. And Value Shuffle is an extension to CoinShuffle Plus Plus, which makes it um, compatible with uh, confidential transactions.